So in my hands here, I have what looks like a normal Pentium CPU, but this uh, surface mount voltage regulation circuitry and the gold pads here in the corner hint that this is something unusual. And if I flip it over here, you can see that it's got a very odd looking pinout that doesn't match what you'd see in a typical Pentium CPU at all. So what on earth is this badly neglected, hacked up looking CPU? It's the very special Pentium Overdrive CPU for 486 systems. And to understand more about what this is and what makes it really special, we've got to cover some history here. So all the way back in March of 1993, Intel released the revolutionary new Pentium processor. And in front of me here is an Intel Socket 4 motherboard with a very early 60 megahertz Pentium, one of the very first released and very rare and hard to come by these days. It had many architectural improvements and it could really run circles around the 46s that were available at the time. But despite its incredible performance, almost nobody owned a Pentium like this in 93. And in fact, it wasn't until probably about 1995 that the Pentium's popularity began to grow in the mainstream market. And that's really because the original Pentium was just very expensive, around $1,000 US just for the CPU. And that's in 1993. That works out to about over $2,000 today if you factor in inflation. And that meant that the 486 continued to dominate the market in 93 and really all the way through 94 as well. But if you bought a 486 system in 1993 or 1994, you know, which were already quite pricey back then, you probably started to cringe when you saw the vastly superior Pentium systems becoming more affordable. And of course, the platforms weren't compatible or interchangeable either. To upgrade, you'd have to get a new motherboard, possibly some new RAM, and your Visa local bus cards were very unlikely to be supported either. You may as well have just gone out and bought a new system by that point. But everybody wanted a Pentium, and Intel was listening. So in 1995, they released the Pentium Overdrive processor. Basically, a Pentium you could just stick in a 486 board, and away you go. Sounds really simple, but behind the scenes, a lot had to be done to make this possible. The 486 and Pentium platforms are very different, especially the external data bus. The Pentium ran at a wider 64-bit bus with much higher bus uh, clock speeds, 60 or 66 megahertz usually, whereas the 486s typically ran at 25 or 33 megahertz. So a 32-bit 486 compatible bus interface had to be added to the chip to make that work. And this meant that it was very bus limited and wouldn't have the same clock for clock performance that a typical Pentium system would. But nonetheless, it was still a true Pentium core with all of those wonderful architectural improvements and especially Intel's next generation FPU, which was just so much faster than the 486s. And although that sounds like compelling of enough reason to upgrade, Intel did something rather special to close the performance gap a bit with this processor. They doubled the L1 cache to a total of 32 kilobytes, which was unheard of at that time. It's a two-way set associative cache, so it's actually 16 plus 16K, but still twice what, the, what uh, the P54C Pentiums had, and really four times what most 486s had. It wasn't quite enough to make up for the bus speed deficiency, but it did help in some situations. And then there's the question of clock speed. As great as the Pentium architecture is, will it be clocked high enough to really perform well? Intel decided to go with a two and a half times multiplier for the overdrive chips. And with a 25 or 33 megahertz bus, that meant that the chips had a rather odd and somewhat low 63 or 83 megahertz clock speed. And you know, at the time that these were released, the normal Pentiums were already available up to about 133 megahertz. So the limited frequency was a tad disappointing for a lot of people. But I imagine there were probably some scaling or power issues that limited its potential somewhat on the 486 platform. So the voltage regulation components on the surface of the chip here are not really something new. Intel actually did the same thing with their DX4 overdrive processor as well that you can see here. So the vast majority of 486 systems out there didn't have onboard voltage regulators for the newer 3.3 or 3.45 volt CPUs. And in order to keep the overdrive processor as compatible as possible, they created it to accept a straight 5 volts from the socket and then regulate it down to the 3.45 volts or so required by the Pentium core. So flipping the chip upside down, you can see that the pinout is very unusual. It actually looks nothing like a typical 486 at all. I've got a uh, DX266 here for comparison, and you can see that it's much smaller. It doesn't look anything like it, really. And I've also got a Socket 5 Pentium chip here, so you can see the difference as well. The Pentium is closer in size to the chip, but again, the, the pinout and the pattern of the, uh, the pins themselves is completely different. 
So interestingly, Intel had been thinking ahead with their 486 sockets for quite a long time, namely socket 2 and socket 3, which are a requirement to use a Pentium overdrive. And if you've ever inserted a 486 into a socket 3 system, you've probably always wondered why the heck it doesn't fill the entire socket. It sort of just sits there awkwardly and occupies the center part of it. And that's because there's a whole other row of pins there to design to support these 237 pin upgrade chips. So looking at the pinout diagrams for this unique layout, you can see that the extra pins are almost entirely for power delivery, with the exception of a couple that are there for write-back cache capabilities. The Pentium Overdrive is clearly more power hungry than your average 486, and the pinout kind of shows that. So the chip I have here today is the 83 megahertz model, designed for systems with a 33 megahertz bus. Sadly, this chip here was badly neglected before it made its way onto eBay. It looks like somebody ripped off the special heatsink for scrap metal, and I'll talk more about why it's special later. But uh, they also chipped the corners off two of the surface mount capacitors here as well. It uh, also had a large number of bent pins that needed to uh, get sorted out as well. So why on earth did I buy such a sorry excuse for an overdrive chip instead of one in better shape? Well, that's because they cost a fortune these days. At least $200 Canadian for one in good working condition. And as cool and unique as this chip is, I'm not willing to pay that kind of money. So I did what I often do. I bought a broken one. It, uh, I mean, I took quite a chance on it, but for, I think it was about $40, including shipping and everything, I thought it was worth a shot. And hey, at least it could be fun to try to restore it to its former glory. But uh, before I do anything or waste my time on this chip, you know, constructing a new cooling system and stuff like that, I need to make sure it works. It was sold as is untested, and I believe it too, because this thing's pins were so out of shape. There's just no way anybody could even get it into a socket to try it out. I uh, spent a bit of time with uh, a mechanical pencil getting them straight, straightened out, and it mostly fits in the socket now. There's a little bit of resistance, but I'm pretty happy with it. I'm a little bit worried about the damaged caps on this thing, so I want to make sure it can provide some good voltage regulation as well before I, I call it usable. Um, I would like to replace these chipped caps, but if it works, then I'll probably just leave them as is. They're a bit of a non-standard size, and getting replacements for that will be really difficult, unfortunately. So this is probably a good time to show you my test bench here that I'm going to use. So this is the Shuttle Hot 433 Revision 4.0. It's a very late model UMC-based 486 board, and it officially supports pretty much every single Socket 3 chip out there, including the Pentium Overdrive. So I'm just going to keep this setup really simple for now. I've just got an S3 Verge graphics card here, 8 megs of FPM memory, and a compact flash card with DOS 622 on it. I've already set all of the required jumpers here for the uh, Pentium Overdrive. It's often called by its code name in the manuals, the P24T. I've also bypassed the um, linear voltage regulator on the board so that the CPU will get a straight five volts from the socket. And again, that's important because the regulation components on the chip itself expects five volts from the socket. Uh, we don't want to use the onboard regulator for that. So now that it's in the socket, uh, I just need to do something to keep it cool. I don't have a heatsink that'll fit neatly on there because of the regulation bit. So I'm literally just gonna place a 92 millimeter fan just off to the side here, just to provide a little bit of airflow. It's a, a ceramic top chip. So that sort of acts as a big heat spreader of sorts. So uh, even just a little bit of airflow is probably fine for some short tests, I think. All right, so now for the moment of truth, let's see if this thing will post with this badly hacked up CPU installed. I could feel it getting a little warm. Nothing on the display yet. Oh, it's alive. <laughs> there we go. P24 TCPU detected and we are in DOS. So that's great. So before I do anything else though, I wanna make sure that this voltage regulator works properly. So let's probe it a bit here. Okay, so this linear voltage regulator here should have um, a voltage in, voltage out, and a ground if I'm not mistaken. So I'm just going to probe each one here and see what we find. So the first one is definitely voltage in. We've got a very accurate 5.00 volts. I really like this power supply by the way. Um, so that looks good. Center pin. Yeah, so that's definitely voltage out to the Pentium core. So we're getting 3.434 volts, which actually looks pretty good. And I'll check that again with some load on the CPU just to see. It's definitely getting a little warmer now. And the last pin should be ground. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's ground. So I don't know if the tab actually registers any voltage. Yeah, so you can get uh, voltage out on the 
uh, regulator tab here on the top as well. So that's good to know actually. So if I construct a heatsink, I gotta make sure nothing touches the edge of this uh, metal tab because I definitely don't wanna put the uh, power through the heatsink, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, let's. Uh, I'm just gonna run 3D Bench 1.0C here and let it loop and then we'll check the voltage again, make sure it's still within spec. It drooped just very slightly. So it's running right now. We got 3.43 volts and I'll just exit the test and we'll see what happens. It goes up very slightly, but it's really solid. So I think that's pretty good. I'm not too worried about that. I'm not gonna worry about changing that uh, cap. And as long as the system stability is good overall, we'll probably just go with that. So looking at the check CPU utility, we can see that everything looks as expected. We've got a P24T Pentium Overdrive with a two and a half times multiplier and a 33 megahertz bus speed. It's even detected as being in right back cache mode, so all looks well. But after running 3D Bench 1.0C, you'll notice that the results are less than stellar, only about 40 frames per second. And in my experience, even a mid-range 486 should do quite a bit better than this. But if we move on to speed sys, we can see the cause. Look at the CPU frequency reported, only 33 megahertz, nowhere near the expected 83. And the CPU benchmark score here seems to confirm that this is indeed the case. It only does a little better than a DX250 with a score of 24.64. So at 33 megahertz, this thing is indeed the slowest Pentium you'll ever find. So why is this chip running without any internal clock multiplication? Well, that's because it thinks its fan has failed. So although most 486s can get away with passive heat sinks, or even no heat sink at all in some cases, Pentium chips run quite a bit hotter and have higher TDPs, even more so when you've got like a voltage regulator sitting right on the top of it. But Intel didn't just slap a heat sink onto the Pentium overdrive. They went the extra mile and did something pretty unheard of in those days, active fan monitoring. So my beat up CPU here doesn't have any part of the cooling system left on it, but there are three gold contact pads in the corner and the retail heatsink had some spring-loaded pins that make contact with these pads. They provide power, but also sense whether the fan is spinning at a high enough RPM or not. If the fan fails for whatever reason, the CPU reduces the internal multiplier from 2.5 down to 1, effectively running the CPU at the bus speed. And this lowers the power consumption and heat output quite a bit so that it can run safely without cooking itself. So as expected, one pad is plus five volt and another is ground to provide power, but there's a third pad used to quote unquote sense the fan. And modern fans today would probably use a tack signal for this purpose, but this system here works a bit differently. The stock fan is designed so that the resistance on this pad will vary depending on how fast the fan is spinning. The higher the RPM, the lower res the resistance. And if the fan stops spinning, the resistance should be very high. In my case, the resistance is infinite basically because there's no connection at all between these pads. So the CPU believes the fan is not spinning. So in theory, it should be very easy to trick the CPU into thinking there's a functional fan here. All we need to do is ensure there's a sufficiently low resistance across the sense and ground pins and we should be good to go. The big question of course is what should the resistance be with a healthy fan spinning? I tried to find out, but there really isn't any solid information out there, but I can say that many people have simply shorted the pads with a jumper wire, and this is enough to get the multiplier back to 2.5. I did measure about 1.8 kilo ohms across the pads with the system running, so there really shouldn't be much current traveling across it when they're bridged. But um, I don't really like this idea too much because it's not really what the CPU is designed for, and I'd much rather have some resistance across the pads instead. And after doing some digging, I saw that people had success with resistances as high as 5 to 10 kilo ohms, with most people just using a 1 to 2 kilo ohm resistor. So I'll test with both a straight bridge and a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor as well. All right, so for this next test, it's going to be a bit sketchy, but I basically just have a, I'm not sure if you can see that there, but there's a tiny piece of bare wire uh, stuck on some captain tape here. And I'm just literally going to stick it across these two pins and get them shorted out. And in theory, that should be all I need to do to get uh, the two and a half times multiplier. So let's see what happens here. And as you can see, Speedsys now identifies the chip is running at 83 megahertz. And the CPU score looks way better at 61.63. We'll do some more benchmarking soon and compare this to some typical 486s. But for now, I'm just happy this thing's running as it should be. One uh, quick note though, the CPU is getting very hot at 83 megahertz, even with the fan next to it. So I did place a small aluminum heatsink on it, which seemed to help. 
but there's no question that this chip needs active cooling, that's for sure. So this is probably a good time to showcase some of Intel's included software that shipped with the OverDrive processor. I didn't have the original disk, but it is available at the Internet Archive for anyone looking for a copy. The disk includes a few neat tools, including something called Fan Monit, which will tell you if your fan is operating correctly or not. Since I have the FanSense pad bridged to ground, it genuinely thinks the fan is good right now. There's uh, even a version of this for Windows 3.1, actually. But what's really cool is the Demo and Diagnostics DOS program. So Intel really went all out on this utility and it's got some fancy VGA graphics going on as well. There's a few tools included and one of my favorites is the animated CPU installation demo. It's really long but also really cool so I am going to include the full demo at the end of the video for anyone who'd like to see it so stay tuned for that. But there are a couple of neat diagnostic programs here as well. There's another fan monitor just like the DOS tool I showed you earlier but in this fancy graphical interface instead but all it really tells you that the fan is working properly or not. The uh, processor instruction test runs through 250 iterations uh, over seven different categories and lets you know if your processor failed any of them. I must say I was a tad relieved to see that my beat up overdrive processor did pass them all. And since the next generation FPU was such a selling point for the Pentium, it only made sense to include a floating point conformance test to run through 16 different operation types. Again, I was a little bit relieved to see that my processor passed them all. But uh, again, I'll include a full playthrough of the installation demo if you'd like to see it at the end of the video. All right, so now that I'm confident the chip's in good working order, it's time to get a cooling system created for it and to do a proper fan sense mod on it. But uh, one of the first things I'm going to have to do is get this old thermal glue off the chip, which is going to be a royal pain. It's super hard. I'm not sure what it's made out of, but after messing with it for a bit, it seems the only way to get it off safely is just to chip it away a tiny bit at a time with a knife. So I'm going to have to spend some time and get that off. But uh, for heat sinks, I've got a few options here. They're very cheap nowadays on Amazon. You can get a pack of five for just a few bucks. The uh, dimensions of the chip here are 50 millimeters square, but unfortunately it's really hard to find a heat sink with an overhang that will clear the uh, regulator bits here, unfortunately. So I have a couple options. Either I can buy a larger heat sink and do a lot of cutting, or I could buy a smaller one that just avoids these bits. The uh, first one I got here is 40 by 40 millimeters. It's nice and substantial and has a thick base on it. But unfortunately it's just a little bit too large. It, uh, it does overhang the chip a little bit. And I definitely want to avoid that because a lot of these 46 boards have, you know, capacitors and jumper banks right near the, uh, the socket and I don't want to cause any obstructions. So I'd also have to cut a lot of aluminum off that one. So I just don't think it's worth it. The uh, next one I've got here is a small little 35 millimeter heatsink. This one's better in the sense that it does clear the regulator just fine and it doesn't overhang the chip. But uh, I don't know what you think, but to me that just looks really dinky and I think this chip deserves a, a better heatsink than that. And last but not least, I found this very interesting heatsink on Amazon. It's not a perfect square. It's um, 36 and a half by 37 and a half, but amazingly it fits just about perfect on this heatsink. So it goes all the way to the regulator bits just slightly and doesn't overhang, which is exactly what I want. And it's also much more substantial than the 35 millimeter one, a lot taller and it's got a thicker base as well. So I think that should work pretty good. Um, and as an added bonus, you can see that the fins align perfectly for use of a 40 millimeter fan, which is great. Really like that as well. So I'm thinking this one's the winner, that's for sure. So when it comes to positioning on the chip, um, I could actually just put it off to the side a little bit like this. And that'll, you know, not obstruct the gold pads, which is great. Doesn't touch the regulator bits. But it does look a little funny like that, and I kind of want to keep that 83 megahertz uh, etching in the corner visible. So I'd really like to center it. I think it just looks a lot better like that. The only unfortunate thing is if I do that, it does obstruct one of the gold pads there. So I'm probably going to have to cut one or two fins off the corner just to, uh, to make that work. But that's okay. Um, you'll still have three fins available that I can screw the fan into, so I think that should work just fine. So for fans, I've got a few options. I originally considered powering the fan from the CPU's gold pads, just like the OEM heatsink does. 
But if I did that, I'd be limited to 5 volt only fans. And if I ever wanted to replace it, it'd also be a bit tricky because the leads would be soldered on. Instead, I'm just going to use a regular 12 volt fan instead that'll be powered by a Molex adapter. Just gives me a lot more flexibility. I've got a couple of Noctua fans here, but I really like this uh, 20 millimeter thick model. It's uh, fairly quiet and has a pretty good amount of airflow, and I think it should be perfect. It also looks pretty impressive when it's on this uh, heatsink here. It's almost as thick as the heatsink itself and just looks really beefy, so I think we're going to go with this one. So I haven't decided how I'm going to mount the heatsink to the CPU yet. I'm really not a big fan of thermal tape because it doesn't always have the best hold and not really the best for thermal transfer either. I did buy this uh, MG Chemicals Thermal Epoxy here. This is the fast curing variety. The only problem is it's a very permanent bond and it would make this heatsink mount more or less irreversible. So if I do ever find an OEM heatsink that'll fit, it'd be nice to be able to reverse this. I may give it a try with some tape first just to see how it holds. Um, otherwise I may try the epoxy, but haven't decided yet. We'll see. So after slowly chipping away at that old thermal glue, man, that took a lot longer than I thought it would. But I finally got it all off. I cleaned up the remaining residue using some fine grit sandpaper. Then I gave it a good cleaning with some isopropyl alcohol afterwards. I think the final result looks good. The surface is flat, clean, and should be ready for the new heatsink. So after cutting away the corner and getting it cleaned up, I'm pretty happy with the test fitting here. I can now center it without obstructing the gold pads or the 83 megahertz etching on the other corner. I did scratch up the gold finish a little bit with a saw, but that's okay. So next it's time to do more of a proper fan sense mod. I tested a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor using some tape and it did work just fine, so I'm gonna go with that. The space between the sense and ground pads is actually about perfect for a surface mount resistor. The pads are pretty big, so I did have to use quite a bit of solder here. It's hard to make it look neat, but after cleaning everything up with some IPA, I think it turned out pretty well. All right, so here's the final product. And as you can see, the heat sink is now attached there. In the end, I decided not to use the thermal epoxy and I used some thermal tape instead. I just wanted to make sure I could remove the heat sink in the future if I ever needed to. And with thermal tape, I should be able to pry it off without too much trouble and without damaging the ceramic top. For uh, thermal tape, I bought some higher quality stuff. It's uh, got a good thermal transfer rating and it has a really good hold too. I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's like a heavier type of material that feels like a thinner version of a thermal pad that you'd find on video card memory. So I think that uh, is a lot better than some of the cheap sticker type stuff that you find out there. I did test it out by running the CPU without a fan and the heatsink did indeed get quite hot in a pretty short period of time, which is a very good sign. The, uh, oh, it looks like my little sticker's fallen off there. The uh, 40 by 20 millimeter Noctua fan here just looks both awesome and ridiculous at the same time. I really love it. And best of all, it's very quiet and keeps the CPU nice and cool. And I'd go so far as to say this thing probably works better than the OEM cooler. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy with how it turned out. Um, now that this thing's all set up, let's run some benchmarks against some typical 4 to 6 CPUs and see if this thing really was a worthwhile upgrade back in 1995. So first up are some synthetic CPU benchmarks, and as expected, the Pentium outperforms even the DX4100 by a healthy margin. The DX4 I used for this test is actually Intel's fastest 486 ever released and uses 16K of right back L1 cache. But even though it's got almost a 20 megahertz clock speed advantage, it's still 20 to 30% slower here. And that gap grows very significantly when you look at the popular DX266. The Pentium is more than twice as fast in speed sys. And when you look at an older chip like the DX33, it's really incredible just how much faster the Pentium overdrive is. So moving on to 3D Bench 1.0C, you can see that the Pentium only leads the DX4 by a small margin here. But there's more to this benchmark than just CPU performance. At those speeds, the VGA card is probably beginning to hold things back a bit. But nonetheless, the performance boost over the DX266 and DX33 here is very substantial. And in a real-world game like Doom, we pretty much see the same pattern. There's a small lead over the DX4, but again, huge gains over the DX266 and DX33. And what about the famous next-gen float point unit in the Pentium? Is it really that much faster than what's in the 486? Yes, much faster, more than twice as fast. But that's not even really a fair comparison because the DX4's previous-gen FPU is running almost 20 megahertz faster than the Pentium's here too.
The original Quake released back in 1996 made very heavy use of float point math, and it was one of the first games to actually require an FPU to run. It's no secret that it was developed with the Pentium architecture in mind, and although you can run the game on a 486DX series chip, or even a 386 with a math coprocessor, it was never intended to run well on those systems. Even a very fast DX4 system just can't run Quake smoothly enough for it to be enjoyable. Given the popularity of the game back in 1996, I'm sure quite a few people looked at the Pentium Overdrive processors to see if their aging 486 rig could possibly run this state-of-the-art game. And although it's not buttery smooth, as you can see the game is playable, and the difference is very drastic compared to the slideshow you get with a 486, that's for sure. At uh, over 20 frames per second in the benchmark, that's quite good, and it's even faster than a 160 megahertz overclocked AM 5x86 CPU. The next generation FPU really does make all the difference in a game like this. So the big question, of course, is it worth it? Really, I should be talking past tense here. So let's just pretend it's 1995. And the answer is, it depends. First, it depends on what 486 you're upgrading from. A chip like the DX4 is already pretty potent and the performance gap isn't huge in some situations. But if you start talking about a DX266, or especially an older DX or SX chip, the difference can be night and day. Doubling or tripling your CPU performance for only 300 bucks? That was a pretty good deal back in 1995. And second, when it comes to gaming, it really depends on whether or not you have a system with a fast Visa local bus or PCI graphics card, or if you're stuck with an ISA card. Even with a very fast processor, ISA graphics just won't cut it for later DOS titles, and a CPU upgrade might not really be worth your while. And finally, if you were one of the few people that used apps that made heavy use of float point math, it could definitely be a very substantial upgrade. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this look at a very unique upgrade processor from back in 1995. I'm really glad to finally have one in my collection and that I was able to save this one from being scrapped as well. I hope to use it again in some future videos and at some point I want to do a showdown and pit this processor up against its upgrade rivals from both AMD and Cyrix, which should be very interesting. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to include the full playthrough of the Intel installation demo at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. It's really cool and definitely worth the watch. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Bertrand Guégan, and I apologize in advance because I probably mispronounced your name there, but Bertrand composed the audio track for me that you'll hear during the demo. It's very exciting that the vSwitch Zero channel has its own original 90s inspired soundtrack now. Bertrand's a very talented musician and composer, he's done some awesome video game music over the years. He actually created this one using an old school AdLib tracker, and it can even be played back on real OPL3 hardware, which is awesome. I'll include a link to his SoundCloud page in the description if you'd like to check out more of his work. Thanks again, Bertrand. Really appreciate it.